With that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Dr. Stephanie Morgan is our urogynecologist at the Iowa Clinic Ankeny location. She is board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology, as well as urogynecology and reconstructive surgery. Dr. Morgan received her medical degree from the University of Iowa and completed her fellowship in clinical urogynecology and reconstructive pelvic surgery there as well. Dr. Morgan joined the Iowa Clinic in 2002 and considers it a profound honor and privilege to be able to care for women with pelvic floor disorders. Welcome, Dr. Morgan. Thanks for that great introduction. I appreciate it. And welcome. It looks like we have Wow, um, almost 100 people signing on already. That's great. And it's really nice to be able to talk to all of you. Today, really the whole purpose of getting together to talk about urinary incontinence is to give you an idea of what a typical patient experience will be like at the Iowa Clinic in Urogynecology for a visit and for an evaluation. Um, many times, one of the first questions that I get when a patient comes in for a visit with me or with one of my um, advanced practice providers is, how did you end up in this field? How did you get to be a urogynecologist or why do you do this? And there's a lot of hows and whys, but it's obviously a very satisfying profession for me. I went to the University of Iowa College of Medicine and did all of my training in Iowa and I'm from Iowa. So like Sadie said, it's absolutely a privilege to be able to take care of patients um, here in our local community. Um, urogynecology um, is special to me because we focus on the care of women throughout their reproductive lives. Most of the patients that I take care of are past their reproductive years or in the midst of it, if you know what I mean. Um, definitely taking care of exclusively adult women is um, an honor and a privilege and taking care of some of the most difficult and personal problems that, can, that we can encounter um, has been very rewarding and satisfying. So we'll make sure that we have some time for questions at the end, so we better get right into it here. So when you come to my clinic, um, in addition to seeing me, I have um, two excellent advanced practice providers, and many new patients will start their evaluation and treatment with either Stephanie or Jessica, who both have many years of experience in gynecology and now training in neurogynecology as well. Um, they are experienced and absolutely um, a great help, and um, I'm very, very proud to call them members of my team. In addition to my advanced practice providers, when patients are checked in or when they are brought back into my clinic, I have um, both um, nursing and administrative um, help. Our um, patient care specialist, Elizabeth, and my two nurses, um, Emily, Savannah, and um, Kim Nielsen, who is not pictured here. So many patients, when they first come to the clinic, really are worried and they don't know what to expect. And they're wondering if they're going to have painful testing or if something is going to be done to them at that first visit. And I just wanna take this time to stop and reassure you and let you know that there is mostly a, a process of information gathering that's going on at this first visit. So most of the time when you schedule your first patient, there is paperwork that is mailed in advance, as well as a bladder diary. And I'll show you a little bit of a bladder diary later, but the paperwork isn't very much compared to what I've seen from some other clinics, but it is a basic medical history, medications, and the bladder diary is really a special part of, of your evaluation. And you certainly wouldn't want this, but many patient, many times I tell patients that the bladder diary is like me coming home with you to see what's going on and for you to tell me right there. You can write anything on it. You can tell me what's going on with your bladder. And it's a very, very helpful tool for me to understand what it's like to live with your bladder problem. So typically when patients do this bladder diary, you would do it before your visit and keep track of what you drink and how often you urinate or times that you have troubles with incontinence so that I can hear about it. There almost always will be a physical examination with a pelvic examination. Definitely the pelvic examination can make some patients nervous or anxious, 
but we will do our best to maintain your um, modesty and make sure that um, we get all of the information that we need as well. It really is an information gathering session. We won't be necessarily doing any treatments or things that are uncomfortable. Um, some patients haven't had a pelvic exam in a while, so it can be, you know, nerve wracking to have that done, but we'll do our best to make sure that if you have any concerns that they're addressed. A bladder scan is one test that we will typically do at your first visit, and it is a painless test where a small device is placed on the pubic bone. It's like an ultrasound, and it tells us if you empty your bladder all the way. Once that public exam and physical exam is done, then I'll try to pull everything together and look at everything to help you understand all of the findings of the exam, find um, understand all of the findings of your bladder diary exam and concerns. And I really want to make sure that I understand the goals for your treatment. Sometimes the plan will include further testing. Sometimes there will be x-rays or other tests that we need to order or go through. And frequently, um, patients have had treatments at other facilities or with other providers or are currently being treated um, with other um, treatment options. And I want to know what all that is. And so we frequently, as a patient, will check out, get um, release of information for previous surgeries or other clinic visits that you've had elsewhere. And if you have any of that you, that you can bring with you or have sent in advance, that helps. But if not, we'll take care of it and make sure that uh, we get all of the best information available for you. So to get right into a patient example, because this really is about a patient experience, I've chosen a sample patient, Mary, who is 48 years old, and she has come to my clinic referred from her primary care doctor. I've not met Mary before. She is new to me. And her First appointment is really a gathering of information so that we can talk about what her goals are, but really find out what's going on. Mary um, has had a long history of urinary incontinence problems. She started having urine leakage after having children. Um, I didn't mention this here, but she's had three children and she started having leaking after the second one. She had urinary incontinence for many years that was mild, coughing, sneezing, but it started to get worse and it started to interfere with her ability to be physically active, exercise. She um, started noticing that she had to wear a pad all the time if she was gonna go for a walk. So about eight years ago, um, somewhere else, she had a sling surgery and she really felt like that took care of most of the problem for her. She didn't have to wear a pad anymore. She was very happy with the situation. But overall, over time, she has noticed that some of her bladder symptoms have returned and they're a little bit different. She notices now that she is having um, more frequent urges to go to the bathroom. And occasionally, if she has held it maybe just a little too long, she leaks on the way to the toilet. And it usually isn't a terribly large amount, but it's noticeable. And she's just gradually noticed this increasing. She feels like she gets her bladder emptied all the way, but she does seem to have the urge to go even right after she urinates, which is not typical for her. She notices now that unlike in the period when after which she had her sling, she was feeling good and her um, um, urinary symptoms were better. She notices now that she's thinking of going to the bathroom all the time and her bladder's always on her mind. Um, she did bring me a bladder diary and I condensed it just into a small area there, but she urinates, you know, about every 45 minutes. It's not very much, it's just a small amount, a couple, three ounces. And, you know, counting it up through the course of a day where she did a full day for me, she urinated 19 times in one 24 hour period. Um, she wrote down a few examples of when she had urinated and leaked on the way to the toilet. And I did ask her to fill out some of her fluid intake. And it looks like she, you know, drinks about four cups of water per day and has some sodas during the day and a couple cups of coffee. She stated this was basically a typical day for her. So we reviewed that information and she gave me some information about the things that make her leak, which would be typically on the way to the toilet or sometimes when she's washing her hands or getting in the shower. We did a physical exam and a public examination. And really her pelvic examination was essentially normal. She didn't have any evidence of prolapse. I didn't see any problems in the area of her previous surgery for incontinence. 
She did not have a bladder infection that day. And I didn't see anything blocking the flow of urine or causing her to not be able to empty. Um, her bladder scan that we did was normal. And we, after gathering all of this information, decided to talk a little bit about what her goals were and what the problems that she's been having meant to her. It's really important that during this conversation about her goals for treatment <clears throat> or goals for evaluation of this problem, for her to know that this isn't a normal part of aging and that this can be an entirely new or different bladder problem than either what she had before or what her mother or grandmother had. So I let her know I was really glad that she came in for evaluation, but it isn't normal and it absolutely can be treated and we will hope to give her that confidence. <clears throat> so many patients feel that this can be a normal part of aging and you know you just have to live with it or if I just focus hard enough, maybe I won't have to go to the bathroom or leak. But usually there is actually you know a physical part of this and a problem going on and um, I like that this says that our body is trying to tell us something. So I let her know that one in six adults has bladder control problems, and there's different various types that we'll go through in a little bit, but incontinence can affect people of all ages. It can affect and disturb our sleep. It can make us less confident to go and do the things we'd like to do to you know, run up to the top of that stadium to watch a football game without feeling like you have to run down every 45 minutes during a game watching your children or grandchildren or your favorite team. It can lead to self-esteem and self-confidence problems as well as isolation and being afraid to leave the house, which as we all know, can lead to deterioration in quality of life and health. So, Another question that patients ask me frequently during this evaluation is, why do I have this? How did this happen? Or, you know, what did I do wrong? Have I, you know, have I done something wrong? Is it in my head? And no, the, certainly there, this isn't an all-inclusive list and I'll go through some things, but our daily habits of what we eat and drink, how we use the restroom, and some of our general health issues can absolutely interfere with normal bladder and bowel function. We've all heard that pregnancy, childbirth, and pelvic floor injury can affect bladder function. And many patients start to notice that these symptoms worsen as we age and as we get to menopause, which really is what has led to the myth that this is a normal part of aging because so many you know, women experience a worsening of these symptoms as they get past the childbearing age and into menopause, that it must be normal. But just because it's common doesn't mean that it's normal. So there are medical history specifics and conditions that can be identified. And I like to review these with each patient. Um, for example, patients who have a history of diabetes have a significant increase in their chance of bladder problems because of the overproduction of urine or polyuria as blood sugars get high. It's also possible that patients who have had um, pelvic surgery, such as cesarean section, such as hysterectomy, such as colon surgery, those things somehow interfere and interrupt the communication between the bowel and the bladder, and they can interrupt function as well. Most of those things, even though we can't change the fact that somebody has had back surgery or pelvic surgery, absolutely it is possible to um, chip away at problems related to those. So it's important for me to gather this history. Patients with neurologic conditions, such as um, psychiatric disorders or um, um, dementia, as well as other um, neurologic problems that can interfere with the communication between the brain and the bladder, I um, mean, we'll get into this a little bit later, but it, all of those things can worsen as women go through menopause. And so not just focusing on menopause as a cause, but how all of these medical conditions contribute to the worsening of symptoms, this can peak at, as women reach or get past into the ages of menopause. Speaking of the influence of menopause on our bladder and bowel control, um, Maria didn't look, I'm sorry, Mary didn't look like she was absolutely going through um, a raging menopause at that moment. She was still having periods. But it is important to note that as these symptoms worsen, as we get into the menopause years, 
things like urinary tract infections, dryness or painful intercourse, as well as um, you know the poor sleep that can come along with menopause, can all add up to a worsening of urinary symptoms. And we do know now that the worsening of those urinary symptoms can be linked to the gradual lowering of estrogen levels. And we call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So it's not just hot flashes, night sweats. A lot of these problems happen below the waist and can be very much a problem for women with bladder control and bladder control problems. So an evaluation of how menopause has affected her symptoms will definitely be a part of this discussion because at age 48, um, Mary is definitely headed there. So there are some treatments that can certainly help this. So when she and I are talking about why she feels the urge to go to the bathroom all the time, even though she has just urinated, I think it's important to just point out, like I just went through, there is a communication pathway between the brain and the bladder. And I'll include the bowel in that as well. So some of the same nerve pathways that control our urinary and bowel function run all the way up and down our spine and are attached through sacral nerves to the bladder and the bowel and the micturition center in our brain. And I really like this picture, even though it's technical, because it does demonstrate anything that can happen between that brain and the bladder can interfere with normal function. So I think going through with Mary about what type of bladder control problems she has had will be helpful in dividing out problems that we see in typical patients. So for example, she's previously su suffered from stress incontinence and did have that treated surgically. Urinary retention is an example of a bladder problem that we won't get into too much here, but we always check for it at almost every visit for bladder control patients. And urinary retention means the bladder doesn't empty all the way. And that can happen for a variety of problems, whether they're medical, surgical, or neurologic. And then overactive bladder, which will be a great deal of the focus of my discussion today, because that is Mary's problem. She has overactive bladder, and we'll get into a little bit of more detail about that. Going back to her stress incontinence, just to review, Stress incontinence is not emotional stress, it's physical stress on the neck of the bladder. When you cough or sneeze or lift or jump, it's usually fairly predictable in the sense that a small squirt or a small little bit of urine comes out right at a moment where the pressure on the bladder is increased. And those urethral sphincter muscles that you see there aren't quite strong enough to hold it back. Stress incontinence treatments um, are not just surgery, even though that's what she had. Generally, patients who come to see us with stress incontinence, we have a variety of conservative and medical treatments that are safe and effective. And many patients with stress incontinence never need surgery or a surgical treatment. Um, for example, pelvic floor physical therapy or pelvic floor muscle strengthening exercises are highly effective in this regard. For patients who still have leaking despite strengthening their pelvic floor muscles, we could be, um, she could come to our office to be fitted with a small silicone incontinence ring that she wears up inside the vagina. And a vaginal incontinence ring can be taken in and out. You could wear it to the gym or on a long walk or while training for a marathon and then taken out when you don't need it. And so those are conservative, non-surgical things that don't have, you know, essentially any risk and are very helpful in treatment of stress incontinence. And then patients who don't have luck with conservative treatments or whose symptoms seem to progress with time, there are procedural and surgical treatments that can be undergone. And stress incontinence can be treated with um, urethral bulking injections, which I guess are like a filler um, for the bladder. And you can see a little picture of a bulking injection there. Bulking agents are meant to provide a little bit of a stopgap to do what our muscles are not doing for us. So bulking agents are um, popular because they don't have a lot of downtime. They're not very high risk. They are a permanent implant, but they're not necessarily a surgery where I'm making an incision. Bulking agents usually need to be repeated and might need to be done more than once. And then a mid urethral sling or a sling procedure, which is what Mary had, generally is the surgical treatment for incontinence with the highest long-term success and satisfaction rate. But as it, being, as it is a surgery, it has more risks and um, things, you know, 
to go through before considering having that done, usually we would do a little more testing than we would do in one office visit before proceeding with anything surgical. I didn't mention bowel incontinence on the other slide, but it absolutely is something that goes along with all of this. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't leave it out um, because it is really an important part of brain and bladder um, continence control. And believe it or not, about 20% of my patients that I see for overactive bladder also have troubles with bowel incontinence. And it is you know, such a frustrating and yet treatable problem and I wouldn't want to leave it out. So I add this in, in that many, Many people and providers don't really realize that urogynecologists treat this, but we absolutely do. And there are some very good and effective treatments available, both conservative and procedural. So when we're talking about overactive bladder, which is Mary's diagnosis, um, we have some medical criteria that absolutely help with our um, diagnosis um, process. But her symptoms seem fairly obvious and her bladder diary really helps if someone has the uncontrollable urge to go that is dominating their thought process during the day and is more than eight times per day, even in a poorly hydrated person that would you know, define overactive bladder. Some patients even hear running water or try to get in the shower and then have a large accident on the way to the toilet. And in other cases, it's much more mild like, like Mary's where she is starting to have dribbles on the way and may even have to change her clothes a couple of times per week. So when I'm going through with her what her treatment options are for overactive bladder, there are three categories. And even though we don't go all the way to advanced therapies after one visit, we definitely, I definitely want to give her hope that through different through the process of her treatment and evaluation, she has lots of options and we'll always start with simple before we get more complicated. So here in the Des Moines area, we are very lucky in that we have access to a great deal of help for conservative and behavioral modification of overactive bladder. So lifestyle changes can be extremely helpful in controlling urgency, urge incontinence, and overactive bladder. And when I include pelvic floor strengthening into these lifestyle changes, it's because it is a safe, effective, and low-risk therapy that can be a complete cure for some women. Um, more often than I can even count, I see a patient who I see back after going to see a female pelvic floor physical therapy specialist for some bowel or bladder retraining, say that her symptoms are in control and she does not need any further treatment. And those are almost the most satisfying visits, even more so than when somebody reports, you know, that a surgery has worked well, because it's so satisfying to see that a patient through her own work and her own commitment to improving her condition has, you know, taken care of it. And so I'm always really pleased to hear that. So in addition to going through that bladder diary where, um, Mary has indicated that she drinks quite a bit of soda and drinks quite a bit of coffee and not quite as much water as she probably should. We would definitely go through that. And, you know, it's not that treats like coffee or Mountain Dew are evil and bad. They're fun and a great way to perk yourself up in the middle of a long day, but they really shouldn't be your total wake up or your only source of hydration. And it's more often than I'd like to say that I see someone who's bladder diary is coffee, 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 or all Mountain Dew, diet Mountain Dew sometimes. Um, and so we usually go through that because even though there usually is a period of time in our life where we can get away with drinking fluids like that, it doesn't last forever. And in someone who has overactive bladder, it's a pretty big win and an easy win to cut back on those treats, is what I like to call them, and increase fluids. And I certainly would recommend to Mary that she take some water up with her to bed, drink that water first thing in the morning so that she has a good base of hydration going before she is having her treat of Mountain Dew or coffee. There are some patients who have significantly irritated bladder conditions who really can't drink those things, but it is such an improvement for them to quit them that it's usually worth it. And um, patients will individually find that out. So, Bladder and bowel retraining, and this is, you know, definitely a complex process that can be made easy by the help of a specialist. 
And I mentioned that there are female pelvic floor physical therapy specialists who can guide patients through a series of mind over bladder training techniques that can help improve bladder control, help reset that um, brain bladder connection and help the brain reassure the bladder that it can make it there on time. That is something that usually is done gradually. It takes time for anything like that to improve. It's, it's therapy after all. And just like in therapy, you're working through issues and situations and then applying them to your life. You'll set goals with the bladder training therapist to try to achieve a better bladder control situation. There are apps and online treatment programs available for patients who don't have insurance coverage for pelvic floor physical therapy. I know I learn better when somebody is pointing things out to me in person, but definitely for patients who are not able to have this training in person, there are online resources that are um, absolutely available. So moving away from the conservative and the um, personal functional way of improving overactive bladder. Some patients are, you know, desperate, ready for help, and medications can provide help fairly quickly. So medication treatment for overactive bladder can provide freedom to leave the house, the ability to drive your car for a long ride without having to pull over or stop. And for patients who find that these symptoms are getting to be um, a burden on their quality of life, um, medication therapy is can be very helpful fairly quickly. There are two categories of medication therapy for overactive bladder. And the one category that we've had for a very long time is the anticholinergics. And those are generally generic now. They have been around many, many years. And they usually take effect anywhere from 72 hours to two weeks after starting them. The benefit of Oral medication for overactive bladder is that it usually is kicked in and effective by two to three weeks um, in most patients. The way oral medication works is that you would take a pill and there are uh, receptors on the bladder wall that are activated and it encourages the bladder to hold it or decreases urgency and signals sent to the brain by acting on the muscle of the bladder. So the down, the downside of these medications, the anticholinergics anyway, is that about 30 to 40% of patients at least will have side effects from them. And the side effects can be significant because these anticholinergic medications are not specific to just the bladder. Those anticholinergic receptors are all over the body. And so patients have dry mouth, they have constipation, they have dry eyes. And even though they can be very effective in keeping the bladder more dry, we worry about buildup of these types of medications in the system. And there are studies ongoing right now to investigate about the possibility of increasing the risk of dementia. So anything that can do that, obviously, we are not going to make that our long-term management option. But these medicines do give some patients quality of life and independence back, and they're about 60%, 80% effective between those two numbers. Better from a medication standpoint is to go with the beta-3 agonists. And the beta-3 agonist medications are bladder receptor activator medications, and they're essentially hold it receptors. And so the two medications listed here are well tolerated. Um, they are more expensive than the generic anticholinergic medications, of course. And many insurance plans require patients to try one of those first medicines before they can have access to those. That is getting better, and we are seeing more insurance coverage for these medications. They are generally well tolerated, but they are more expensive. Um, occasionally with um, Vibragram, we do have to, um, I'm sorry, occasionally with Miravagram, we have to check patients' blood pressure and um, blood pressure elevation, although not a common side effect, we would watch for that. And so these medications have been tested in the elderly. They have been tested to be safe and effective and probably will end up being a better option for more patients than the first category. So overall, oral medications for overactive bladder have to be taken every day. They can have side effects that are bothersome, but most um, surveys indicate that about 70% of patients end up discontinuing them within six months. And so there's a variety of reasons for that, whether it's cost, whether it's concern about taking too many medications, concern about polypharmacy in elderly patients, or um, eventually some medications just stop working, just like all medications, and they need to be switched to something different. So 
oral medications are not always the plan for long-term care for patients with overactive bladder. So a lot of patients will ask me, what happens when I take these medications? What, you know, will it cure my overactive bladder? Can I take it for a while and then stop it? And I will say that the answer in most cases to that question is no. <clears throat> most of the time, patients who develop a worsening overactive bladder problem, most patients will need some sort of treatment off and on during the course of their life. Not everyone, but it definitely can happen that overactive bladder is a long-term problem that may need more than a short-term solution or more than a lifestyle change or medication solution. So while Mary and I are having her first visit, even though she's not going to move to a long-term or an advanced third-line overactive bladder therapy, I usually go through some of the options that are available because I want to give her hope that I'm not going to move on to some mystery surgery or that there is you know, no hope for her and that medicine is all we have. So I usually try to cover these things time permitting um, to make sure that she knows that there are other ways to treat this problem. So advanced therapies for overactive bladder typically are longer term treatments for a long term problem. And I like to divide them for patients into two categories. <clears throat> like medications, bladder Botox injections are a medicine that is directly injected into the spasming overactive bladder. And the benefit of having the medicine injected as opposed to taking it orally and letting it get all the way down to the bladder is that it is directly applied. So there aren't the dry mouth and constipation side effects. Overactive bladder Botox is performed in the office. And we typically would see a patient for about an hour visit every six to nine months. Bladder Botox injections usually last six to nine months. And then we would repeat that in the office. So patients would come back for a treatment when their symptoms return. Some of my long-term patients who know that their symptoms are going to return, we schedule it automatically so that they don't have to experience that roller coaster of symptoms coming back. So the Botox is injected through a small camera that I place into the bladder after having used numbing gel for about 30 minutes. And then the injections typically take me about five to 10 minutes to do at the most. I usually do 10 to 12 injections and patients might feel three to four of them. Most patients tell me they feel a little bit like a pinch. If they feel it, they feel like a pinch and that it is an experience that can easily be done in the office with good control of discomfort. There are downsides to Botox injections in the bladder. And for patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections, which you know is not rare, I don't typically recommend Botox because we don't want to worsen recurrent bladder infections. <clears throat> and one possibility of Botox injectable overactive bladder treatment is that it could actually work too well. And urinary retention means that the bladder can't empty effectively because the muscles are partially paralyzed and can't empty all the way. If temporary urinary retention became significant enough, then self-catheterization could be necessary. And fortunately, that is a rare problem, but it is something to be aware of. So the second category of overactive bladder long-term treatments is not a medication and does not involve medicine treatment of the bladder muscle like oral medications or bladder Botox does. So the second large category of overactive bladder treatments is called neuromodulation. And I'm back to this picture again that shows the nerve connection and the nerve communication between the brain and the bladder. And neuromodulation is where we use nerve stimulation at different and various parts of the body to control or to send a signal to that pathway between the brain and the bladder that has started to misbehave and give it a boost or give it a reminder to behave itself or give it some stimulation either on a temporary or continuous basis. And so when I say stimulation to the nerve pathway between the brain and the bladder, one way to do that is by using the tibial nerve. Now the tibial nerve is not technically between the brain and the bladder, but luckily the tibial nerve, which is behind the ankle, 
So if you look behind the ankle, that is where on the medial leg or the inside of the leg there, the tibial nerve is where the brain bladder connection nerves come to an end down there. But by stimulating that tibial nerve that we can easily access in the office, we can send a signal that goes between the brain and the bladder and is thought to normalize control of our bladder's natural reflexes. I like to think of it as giving an abnormal connection, something else to focus on. Here's a different stimulation that can distract it from its abnormal communication pathway. So tibial nerve therapy is a very common, safe, really um, no side effect treatment that we have in the office that we would set up for patients if they have completed conservative treatments or medical treatments that have not been effective enough. So typically these treatments would be delivered in my office during 30 minute visits. And these 30 minute visits would be scheduled in a block of 12. So you would come weekly for 12 weeks for a tibial modulation session. And typically when we set up the tibial stimulation, we use a little stimulator with a little acupuncture-like um, needle that goes right to that tibial nerve. Most patients say it feels like a little tingle and we, you can sit and look at your phone or read a book for 30 minutes. Those weekly visits after 12 of them then would be changed to monthly visits for maintenance. And I would say about 80% of patients who do tibial therapy feel like it is an effective and uh, definitely helpful treatment for them. I have some patients who use tibial therapy with medication and I have many patients who have used tibial nerve therapy to get off of overactive bladder medication and have better control. So most patients, when we get into tibial nerve therapy sessions, notice an improvement after two to three weeks. I have the occasional patient who it takes longer and the occasional patient who notices help right away, even with one treatment. So again, tibial therapy is safe and effective without a lot of side effects and is done in the office in person. So another neuromodulation treatment option for stimulation of our nerve pathway between the brain and the bladder is to have a tibial implant. And so tibial implanted therapy is new and the ecoin device is essentially a battery that is implanted behind the ankle right on top of the tibial nerve in about a 30 minute surgery that is done under local anesthetic. It does take about a month of healing to get that little incision healed. And after the patient is healed, then the stimulator would be turned on. And the stimulator is entirely contained within that battery and has about two to three years of automatic tibial treatments in it for about every four days. So there is a recovery period that goes along with this. The ecoin is a new treatment. Tibial therapy, of course, is not new, but the ecoin is a new treatment, and it is about 80% effective in improving symptoms, just like tibial therapy in the office. This treatment would have the advantage of not having to come to the office for every treatment once the initial implant and healing and recovery time is over. So the nerve modulation treatment therapy that has been around the longest, about 25 years, is Interstem. And Interstem is an overactive bladder treatment. It is an advanced neuromodulation treatment that provides continuous stimulation to the nerves as they come out of the tailbone, headed to the bladder. And it has been around, like I said, for 25 years and is a long-term treatment for patients with a long-term overactive bladder problem. So sacral neuromodulation provides gentle nerve stimulation to the sacral nerves as they're exiting the tailbone to correct the communication pathway between the brain and bladder. And I should also mention that it can restore normal bladder and bowel function. So Interstem, like I said, has been around 25 years. It's not new, it's not controversial. And the little battery that provides about 10 years now of therapy can be left in place in an implanted procedure under the butt cheek there. And the little lead that goes from the battery to the nerve area is what sends the stimulation. And this picture, what I like about it is that it shows where the lead goes to stimulate the nerve, but it doesn't show also that it's under the skin. So this is completely implanted underneath the skin. It is like a pacemaker for the bladder. 
So not everybody has heard of this, but bladder and bowel control can be improved with nerve stimulation. And generally, inner stem bladder and bowel control therapy is much more effective than medication for most patients. The best part I think about sacral neuromodulation or inner stem, in my opinion, is that we get to test it before you commit to it. There's really not very many invasive procedures or surgeries that you get to try out to see how it works for you before you commit to it. But it's actually required to test it prior to implant. And so we would do a test in the office or in the surgery center that I'll show you a little bit more about in a minute that I would place two test wires, one on each side of the tailbone and tape them in and you would wear a little belt battery to try it out and actually take it home with you. So the test that we do at the office is called a basic evaluation. And this basic evaluation test we do with you awake and talking to me. And I use two small wires placed next to the tailbone on each side in the local anesthetic. And then you would wear a small battery around your waist on a belt for five days. So it sounds interesting, but you actually get to take home sacral neuromodulation for five days to try it out. And most patients need to do a little bit less than they would normally do during this test period. It's about five days. You wanna keep it dry and not do all of the strenuous physical activity you normally do. But I ask that you record your daily symptoms during this period of time. And if there is a 50% improvement in your daily symptoms, at least, then you would be a candidate and eligible for a impl an implanted interest in stimulator. And that would go in the butt cheek like I showed with this picture right here. Now that implanted stimulator would be a long-term treatment for overactive bladder. Again, like a bladder pacemaker, the little silver battery goes into a small incision that is placed in about a one hour surgery under anesthesia. And the patient can control the stimulation that goes to the sacral nerves with a little device that is like a phone. Now that device can be used to change the stimulation. Most patients just set it and forget it, but this implant can be changed and increased or decreased by the patient, which I think is a great advantage, especially since we're talking about a long-term problem most patients with overactive bladder are going to need some sort of treatment for 10, 20, 30, or more years. It's nice to have something that can be used over the long term and is, is controlled by the patient. Generally speaking, the one hour surgery and the test are covered by insurance. And if the test shows a 50% improvement, then typically the recovery period from a surgery like an interstim placement would be um, a couple of days of downtime and then a week or two of decreasing strenuous physical activity to allow that little incision and implant to heal into place. I think it's important to note, I've talked about two different implants here and there certainly are others available, but I prefer to implant interstim into my patients because it is MRI compatible. As we get older, and I don't know if you've all noticed this, but it becomes more necessary to have tests and scans and this and that. And many of my patients with all of those medical conditions we talked about before need an MRI at some point. And having an MRI compatible system is extremely important to me to be able to let my patients know that their other medical care is not going to be interrupted by that. So I have chosen to implant devices that are MRI compatible in almost any situation. And um, it is an important part of addressing any implant. So one of the many options for overactive bladder treatment, but perhaps some of the longer term treatments are important to mention when I have a first visit with a patient, not because that's what she's going to end up doing, but I want her to know that there isn't some big, mysterious, scary surgery that um, is waiting for her if none of these treatments work. Um, Many, in many cases, medication can be a great long-term treatment option if there aren't side effects and it controls the symptoms. And revisiting bladder training or looking at our dietary things can, can be helpful all along the way. But many patients are looking for a long-term treatment and it should be noted that there are long-term effective treatments that will allow her to not have to live with these symptoms forever. So to summarize those advanced treatment options for patients who have long-term bothersome overactive bladder that isn't due to a quickly correctable 
UTI or medical condition. They could consider bladder Botox muscle injections in the office, tibial nerve stimulation, either in the office or implanted, sacral neuromodulation, which can be a long-term management option for patients with a long-term problem. And really, we want to just give hope that advanced therapies can be very helpful. So some of the initial questions that I um, got when we started working on this webinar were um, a few that are listed here. And I know Sadie is going to pull together some questions from people on our live um, webinar here. But I've had a couple of patients already ask me, you know, what if I've had previous treatment or what if I've had a hysterectomy? Um, can I still do pelvic floor therapy? Will medicines work for me? And Absolutely, yes. Almost everyone I see in the office um, has some sort of medical history that is contributory to their problem or to overactive bladder or urinary incontinence or stress incontinence. And having a previous operation sometimes just makes the evaluation a little bit more um, detailed. Sometimes there will be other testing involved, but absolutely having had previous surgery does not exclude anyone from treatments. Um, Patients who have both bowel and bladder incontinence, absolutely, we follow the same pathway of treatment, conservative treatments, dietary and lifestyle modifications, medications, and then possibly procedures. So about 20% of my overactive bladder patients notice that they also have bowel incontinence problems. And we will see uh, many patients, you know, referred from either primary care or from um, um, GI specialists or um, colonoscopy doctors to discuss this problem. Um, I have many patients with back problems and um, even as far as patients um, having an inner stem inserted, it's absolutely typically fine to have an evaluation for um, an inner stem or sacral neuromodulation if they've had back surgery. And we've talked about a lot of treatments and medicines and procedures, but I have a large number of patients who are keeping their treatments at first anyway, exclusively, you know, conservative and, you know, self-oriented. Um, and that is absolutely fine. We um, can, you can get really good control of your symptoms through non-surgical, natural and conservative treatments for this problem. And we can absolutely guide you on the way and, and you know, give guidance as to what works and what doesn't. So I understand there are some other questions available and I'll turn that over to Sadie. Yes, thanks, Dr. Morgan, for going to the slides. Um, we'll go ahead and go into some questions that were asked during the um, webinar itself here. So the first one, maybe Dr. Morgan, is how does obesity impact overactive bladder? Oh, that is that is a great question. It's one of my favorite questions because I see many patients at all ends of the age spectrum who tell me that they've been told that this problem is because they're overweight. And if they would just lose some weight that this, you know, it's it's really something that, that they can control. And while it is true that in patients who have a significant weight loss, that some types of incontinence can improve, it is absolutely also true that I have many, many skinny, skinny patients who have terrible incontinence. And obesity is not the cause of incontinence. If someone loses weight, some of those symptoms can improve, but it absolutely is not a cure or treatment, and it would never be suggested as the only thing that would work. Um, all of these treatments are available for women who are overweight um, up to even morbidly obese. And so it's absolutely um, important for us to talk to patients who have weight problems as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Morgan. Another question is, um, if a patient has tried PTNS and maybe physical therapy in the past and they did not have any relief with that, what would you recommend as a next step? Well, we certainly would do an evaluation of her medical history. For example, if she has recurrent bladder infections, I wouldn't steer her towards Botox. I would make sure that she has tried one of those new categories of medications, um, the beta-3 agonists, which act on the bladder hold-it receptors, those can be remarkably helpful, either short and in some cases long-term. And if she didn't have any results with tibial nerve therapy, there is quite a bit of evidence to show even that sacral nerve therapy is more effective 
And so offering her a basic evaluation for sacral neuromodulation or inner stem in my office would be a next step as well. Thank you. Yes. Can you maybe give a general statement or an understanding of what a sling surgery would look like? So a sling surgery is for stress incontinence, coughing, sneezing, lifting, jumping, walking. It also can be effective for women who have stress incontinence plus urge incontinence or overactive bladder. We call that mixed incontinence. And sling surgery should be considered for patients who haven't had good luck with conservative treatments. Now, we certainly wouldn't recommend a sling for someone in their first few months of leaking because incontinence is a problem that can come and go. But for a patient who has had quite some time of urinary incontinence that is troublesome with coughing, sneezing, and lifting, further testing would be done in my office to put some numbers on it and look for red flags like incomplete emptying. After a bladder function test called a urodynamic test would be done in the office, then we would talk about the pros and cons of surgical management. Sling surgery is an outpatient surgery. It is done through an incision in the vagina and it involves the implant of a permanent tape of polypropylene mesh underneath the neck of the bladder. And that permanent tape implant acts as a backstop so that when you cough or sneeze or lift or jump or walk, the um, tape stops the leakage of urine. There is a recovery involved. There are some restrictions afterwards during that recovery that you know need to be paid attention to. There is an anesthetic involved and the sling is an implant. So ongoing, like any implant, there are risks of complications due to implants. About 8% of patients could have troubles with that. But overall, in the long-term, slings have anywhere from an 80 to a 90% long-term success rate for stress incontinence and have a high satisfaction rate as well. So they are definitely part of the discussion when it comes to stress incontinence. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, next question is, you mentioned maybe some online apps that might be helpful for pelvic floor strengthening. Do you have any recommendations for patients that they could use? So um, I haven't personally gone through and attended any of the apps myself, and I will get to that, but I know that some of the major um, um, national clinic websites have one. Cleveland Clinic is coming up with one where it is a um, an online pay-as-you-go type of bladder training. We give out pamphlets in our office to an app called Bladder Boss, and um, that's not free, but for patients who can't or don't need a lot of instructions, um, walking through an app for some bladder retraining can be helpful. Perfect. Thank you. And then I'm going to ask one more question here. Okay. Um, what would be the advantage or maybe disadvantages from an insurance perspective of going with the ecoin versus the PTNS, the 12 weeks initially? So there are differences between everyone's insurance policies, and there's no way to make a blanket statement. Um, some patients' insurance cover every single one of the office tibial nerve therapy visits to an excellent degree, and they don't have much um, patient input in terms of finances and others don't have that. And so it is important for patients to um, check that and we help them check that as that process is beginning to see what their financial contribution would be. Um, everybody's insurance is different. We've not run into great troubles overall with either one. And um, typically patients don't have to use insurance to make a decision about which advanced treatment that they would like to do. They generally are very well covered by Medicare. Private insurance companies are all going to be individual, but we would help them check that. Great, thank you. So the American Urogynecologic Society is the society that I belong to, and it's made up of urogynecologists and advanced practice providers and physical therapists who take care of women with prolapse and incontinence and other pelvic floor disorders. AUGS.org is a great website. It is reliable. Um, the information on it has been well researched. They're not trying to sell you anything. Um, and they have some, um, they have a patient website, which is called Voices for PFD. Um, the one right above it is actually Voices for PFD.org. And that's Voices for Pelvic Floor Disorders.org. And I think the last QR code is a link to our website so that if you want more information, these links, or if you want to schedule an appointment, I think that's what that last one is. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, and thank you to everyone for joining us today on this important topic. If you're interested in making an appointment with the urogynecology team or have questions about the patient experience, you can refer to the phone number on your screen.
and we will help you get an appointment scheduled. And just a reminder,